budget base. And I've spent the last six years of my life trying to figure out how much the government spies on us and how they force the companies to whom we entrust our private data to facilitate the surveillance. If you visit the websites of the phone companies and the email providers, in the privacy policy, you'll see vague statements about how they care about your privacy, but you won't find any details about actually how they process the requests and what legal standard they insist on, and for most companies, even how many requests they get. Uh, and so the method that I've used to get data for the past three, three, three or four years, uh, later into the project, were sort of three methods. So the first is that I filed countless FOIA requests, um, which, by the way, is really, really easy to do, and I highly recommend it. If you have a blog, you can usually claim that you're a member of the press and not pay any fees. Um, so that's the first method. The second method uh, is I, I snuck into uh, places I shouldn't be. Uh, I went to a surveillance industry conference in 2009, commonly nicknamed the Wiretappers Ball, um, where I was able to, to hear from many uh, telephone company employees, figure out what they were doing. And then the, the third and most fruitful method has been to actually go out drinking with the lawyers who work for these companies. Uh, and it turns out they, they really just like having someone listen to what, what they do at work all day. Um, so let's talk briefly about what happens in these firms and what they're able to provide. And, and what I want you to understand, more important than anything, is that the phone companies are not going out of their way to spy on you. It's just sort of it's the cost of doing business. If you want to be in the business of providing telecom services and you're using spectrum given to you by the government, then various federal agencies uh, have leverage over you. And if you don't play by their rules, they take away your spectrum or they, they block the installation of towers. They can make life very, very difficult. So the phone companies have to go along. Uh, and protecting your privacy is really not that good for, for business. The money, I mean, well, although you may think the profits that the phone companies make are obscene, um, the amount of money that they have to spend to even push back on a request would likely wipe out the profits they make from you for a few years. So there's just really no incentive for them to do so. But let, let me at least talk about what's possible. So largely I'll focus on location data. So we, we all carry cell phones right now and the phones uh, are constantly tr transmitting to towers, particularly if we have smartphones and there are data connections. Um, the government can get three types of location data. They can get historical, actually four types. They can get historical signal tower data. They can get um, uh, real-time uh, signal tower data, real-time triangulated data, which is based off of multiple towers in some cases, and then real-time GPS data uh, for phones that have GPS chips. Several, maybe, maybe a decade and a half ago, the FCC um, forced, or Congress passed the legislation, and the FCC forced the carriers to provide E911 location capabilities. So this meant that the carriers had to be able to provide, upon request, location information of a certain degree of granularity. But the FCC left it to the carriers to figure out how they were going to implement that. And the carriers basically split along the CDMA and GSM path. So the GSM providers in the US, which is AT&T and T-Mobile for the most part, they decided to go with uh, estimated time of arrival data, so they install this box on every tower. It's usually made by a company called True Position, and this triangulates the location of, of your device. It works in, indoors and it works outdoors, and it doesn't require the assistance of any phone uh, in the field. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's fairly sophisticated technology. So they decided that they would go with, with that path. Uh, Verizon and Sprint decided that they didn't want to do that, and instead they put GPS chips in every phone. Whether the phone costs 20 bucks or $500, Verizon and Sprint just put GPS to chips in the, in the devices, and then upon request, the phone companies can locate individuals. What, why does this matter? Why, why this difference? Well, um, not every device on the Sprint and Verizon network can provide GPS information. The E911 rules only apply to phone, to telephones that you can use to call an ambulance during an emergency, and your laptop or tablet or other data device cannot be used to make calls. And so Sprint and Verizon do not provide E911 capabilities for those data devices. What this means is that when the government wants to locate a data using user, a data using device in real time, uh, they're not able to uh, for those two, two networks. All right, so what does this mean? The government, and, and, and Catherine will, will walk through the sort of insane legal standards that exist uh, and the ease with which the government can get certain types of data. But what you need to understand is that the government is obtaining vast amounts of location data. Uh, normally, we, we, well, it's much easier to obtain the historical information 
and the, the cell phone companies are just are creating it and compiling it and saving it, so it's just sort of there sitting around. Whereas for the prospective information, the real-time information, the GPS or triangulated data, <coughs> the government has to ask beforehand. And so you already have to be under suspicion for the government to ever get that kind of data. So it's much easier for them to get this historical stuff. All right, so the, the companies are receiving all these requests. They're essentially flooded with requests. And the companies receive so many requests that they have teams of people working 24 hours doing nothing but responding to surveillance requests. The, the numbers vary by carrier, and the carriers ha have just recently made stats available because of a, a letter sent by a member of Congress. What we do know is that the, num the total number of requests uh, by U.S. carriers is approximately one and a half million a year. Um, Sprint receives by, by far the greatest number of requests uh, of any cell phone company. They receive 500,000 <coughs> subpoenas alone. That doesn't include wiretap orders, that doesn't include requests for location data, that doesn't include text message information, just subpoenas, which uh, Catherine will probably explain what, what those can uh, obtain. My guess for why Sprint obtained, why Sprint receives one third of the requests uh, nationwide is that Sprint has basically cornered the market in prepaid cell phones. If you're using Boost, if you're using um, Virgin, if you're using several other prepaid carriers, they're likely using um, Sprint's network. And uh, prepaid phones are popular with low-income people, the young, the poor, people living in urban areas who are more likely to be the subject of government investigations. I'm not saying they're more likely to be criminals, but they're certainly more likely to be the subject of, of investigations. And so I think that at least partially explains why Sprint receives so many requests. All right, so Sprint's receiving probably 600,000, 700,000 total requests a year. Um, they're the only company that's broken down the number of location requests they've received, which is 200,000 requests over the last five years, about 40,000 requests a year. That's a lot of requests for them to deal with, and on top of the you know, half a million subpoenas a, a, a year that they receive. And so they have this gigantic team. They have about 200 people doing nothing but responding to surveillance requests. Uh, and Sprint was so inundated with these surveillance requests that it ultimately decided that it couldn't cope. It could not cope with this flood of surveillance. And so what did it do? It created a self-service portal, a, web, a website where law enforcement could log in <laughs> and get this information whenever they wanted. Now the government would have to satisfy the right legal process, but once they would met that process with the appropriate court order, they could log in whenever they wanted. Uh, that website was set up in 2008. Between 2008 and 2009, it was used to generate 8 million GPS data points. That's 8 million individual requests by law enforcement agencies. Now, we don't know how many people that, that, that was. It could be the same person being pinged every second. But it, what you should understand is that when surveillance goes from a manual task to being an automated task, to being a self-service task, the number of requests goes up. Uh, now, the phone companies all charge for their assistance. They charge reasonable costs, whatever that, that, that tends to be. Uh, and over the years, as surveillance has gone from, an, from a manual task, from someone sitting down at a keyboard and typing in an individual request, to being a wholesale, all-you-can-use uh, model, the costs have plunged. And so just, I think, seven or eight years ago, Sprint Nextel charged $150 per GPS pin. Right? Of the, if they charged $150 for the 8 million requests that they've received, that would be $1.2 billion. They would be in, in the black. They actually lost a lot of money. Uh, they've lost money over the last few years. They didn't make $1.2 billion from, from surveillance requests. And what's happened is they went from charging $150 per ping to charging $30 a month, all you can eat, for, for surveillance. And so the police can literally sit at their desk from the comfort of an air-conditioned office. They can track you as you move about your daily life. But well, why does this matter? It matters because the government has scarce resources, right? There are only so many agents who can be tasked with surveillance. And when it takes 10 or 20 FBI agents to tail a suspect as they drive around town, the government has to figure out who it's going to spy on, who's important enough to warrant that team of 20 agents. But when a single agent can track 300 people from their desk just by typing an additional command into the keyboard, well, then the government doesn't have to think as hard about who it wants to spy on. Right? Then anyone who, who appears on their radar uh, is enough to, to get on their, on their request list. All right, so to, to wrap up, and, and, and before I pass over to my colleague, uh, I also want to talk briefly about um, 
the sketchier areas. So we know that the government is obtaining historic, historical location data. We know that they're obtaining real-time location data. We know that they're tracking people in real time. We know that in some cases they have Google Maps type interfaces on our desktops with little dots blinking around. We know that. The scary stuff that we don't know very much about right now um, relates to what are called cell tower dumps. So rather than the government saying, you know what, Ashkan is really sketchy, we're going to spy on him, they say, you know, the people who are near this 7-Eleven, they're really sketchy. So we're going to ask the phone company for the information on everyone who's been near a particular tower in a given hour or two or day period. That's hundreds, if not thousands of people. And most of these people are innocent. In fact, the vast majority of these people are innocent, and their information ends up in databases. So the, the sort of wholesale um, dragnet type location surveillance is definitely something that is scary that we know very little about. The other, the other really concerning thing uh, is something called a community of interest request, which is that if you are under surveillance, the government will typically get information about everyone that you've called and everyone who's called you. We know from a recent letter that Sprint sent to a member of Congress that when they hand over location information, they hand over location information about both sides of the call, if both sides are using Sprint service. So if I'm being monitored by the government, your location information gets handed over if you call me. So there are some really, really sketchy things happening. We don't know very much. Uh, I'm currently litigating uh, my own uh, lawsuit against the Department of Justice to get some PowerPoint slides about their current and, and cutting edge methods of location surveillance. There are several other lawsuits going by several groups, and hopefully um, we'll get a bit more information. The last thing I'll mention before I pass it over, Ash can tee this up. Several of you, I hope, in fact, all of you should use encryption on your smartphone if it's available. Certainly the latest version of Android offers disk encryption. You should certainly be using it on your laptop. So the question that I want you to think about, and I have the answer, but it's a really un unfortunate, depressing answer. But think about this. You're arrested by the police, or you go through a, a border, and the government grabs your cell phone, and they want to they wanna see what you're doing. They want to see what's on there, and you have some passphrase, and so the data is encrypted. What do they do? Well, if it was your laptop, if you're using TrueCrypt on your laptop or, or FileVault on your, on your Mac, um, they'd be out of luck. Maybe they could force you to hand over your password, or maybe they could try and brute force it, but those are the only real options they have. With your cell phone, the smartphone vendor, the platform vendor, Apple or Google, they're in a position to undo the encryption. So the way it works, it varies by, by the two major platform providers. Uh, Apple appears to have some kind of master skeleton key. And so the police send the encrypted phones back to Cupertino, and uh, the, uh, the, the folks at Apple will clone the data off of the phone and then send the police a DVD um, with the data from the device and then send it back. So the police never get access to your phone, but they do get all the data off of your phone. My understanding is that Apple insists on a warrant. It took months of begging and bullying before Apple um, finally uh, told me this. Um, Google is different. Um, Google doesn't uh, have the devices sent back to their headquarters. Instead, what happens is that the police ask Google to change your password. Um, so what happens if you enter the, the, the wrong password into an Android device a few times, it locks you out. And the only way you can get back in is by entering the full um, Gmail address and password. And so what Google will do is change the password to a new one, which they can then give the police. The police get in, and then Google change the password a second time so that your email won't sync and the police won't be able to do ongoing surveillance of you. But in any case, what I want you to understand is that both Apple and Google provide access to encrypted smartphones. And so if you think your smartphone disk encryption is enough, uh, you're wrong. All right, thank you.